Um, and I want to, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, are you a godly woman? Find a woman and ask her, are you a godly woman? I didn't say if you were a sexy woman. I didn't say if you were a rich woman. The question I'm asking today is, are you a godly woman? Did y'all ask them? Did they answer? We're going to find out in a few moments. <laughs> Titus chapter 2, the first five verses, which were read so wonderfully by our worship leader, Minister Terry, says, But as for you, verse 1, speak to things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love and patience. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderous, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands. Did y'all feel the anointing right there in that little part section right there? Did y'all feel, I felt something right there. It was, yeah, okay. That the word of God may not be blasphemed. Amen. You can be seated. Thank uh, Sister Gay Arbuck Gay Arbuckle and Tanya Baker for blessing us. Thank y'all so much. Y'all yeah, want to talk about godly women. I mean, that's a, it's becoming a rare thing to find these days. It's, fine, it's hard to find godly women. I didn't say it's hard to find church-going women. Got a lot of women in church. Church women remain the predominant sex in church is women, but uh, I want to raise the bar because when Paul writes to Titus in this book of Titus, this is a little epistle, it's only three chapters long, he's talking to him from, as a senior spokesman of the faith to a young man who's pastoring and he's giving him advice, he's giving him suggestions, he's challenging him and and right here in this, these first few verses of chapter 2, he lays out to them what a good, sound, solid church looks like. And I've been around the country enough and spoken at enough churches and preached and ministered around in a diff enough different places to recognize that we do have a lot of women in church, but we don't always have a lot of godly women in church. They come to church regularly. Some of them look good. Amen. There's, so, there's some on your row. There's some good-looking women on your row. Look up and down your row and see. Go ahead, point to Say, you look good, girl. Say, you, you look good. But in the words of the great philosopher David Ruffin, beauty is only skin deep. I'm feeling like breaking out into a temptation song right now. God's beauty goes beyond what you look like externally. As a matter of fact, in one place in Scripture, Paul says in 1 Peter, don't let your focus be external development only. If, on this Women's Day, if women spend as much time developing their inward beauty as they do their external beauty, oh, there's tension in the room right there, there's tension. I mean, if you just think, if you put the kind of money and resources and time into your character as you do your hair, look at your neighbors and as you do your hair. Come on, brothers, they ain't going to say amen. Y'all help me out here today. I see right now the women are going to sit tight, not going to say nothing. They're mad. I'm just trying to help you. I'm trying to recognize. I'm trying to be in the word here today because Paul says to Titus how important it is to be able to find a godly woman. And that's what I want to talk about. He's giving them these instructions and he, he tells them. And matter of fact, what I want to do is I just want to, I want to raise this question. I want to make this challenge because Paul uh, says to him, he says in verse 2, when, uh, verse uh, 3, he says, he says in, in, uh, uh, to the older women, he says, here's what, and matter of fact, slow down, Pastor, just slow down. I'm, I'm so excited, slow down. You know, I'm 56 now. I can't think as sharp as I could when I was 55 if something didn't happen. 
I want to ask some questions. I want to ask the questions and I want you to evaluate yourself as to whether or not this determines and makes the declaration for yourself whether or not you meet the criteria of a godly woman. And he says right here in verse number three, he says, the older women likewise that they be reverent in behavior. Here's the first question you got to ask yourself is, do, are you, do you have reverent behavior? Look at your neighbor and say, are you reverent? Ask, them, ask your neighbor that question. Are you reverent? Ask him. Do you have reverent behavior? Do you live your life and conduct your life in what's sacred? If, is your practices sacred? That's what reverent means. Is it proper? Is it right? If Jesus was standing right there with you, doing what you were doing, on the, uh, 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 saying and participating in what you're saying and participating in, would you be comfortable with Jesus standing right there? As a matter of fact, um, he says um, that word reverent in the Greek means holy. There's a curse word in this generation if I've ever heard one. We don't, we don't like holy behavior. We, we, we want to excuse it. But, but Paul says that the older women must be reverent. And it means this. And his, I like this is important because when you're young, you know, your hormones are crazy and you do all kinds of stuff, but at some point, you ought to grow out of your childish ways. And, and you ought to, by, by the time you get to be seasoned, you, you, there ought to be a level of reverence because you've you, you've sown your wild oaks. You've, you've done crazy things. At some point, Grandma, you've got to come out the spandex. At some point, Grandma. The droop is not what people are looking for. Droop, hang down, no longer straight, it's just drooping down. Move on. I feel like I need to stay right here for a second. Because a lot of the grandmas come to the 8 o'clock service. And uh, they still think they got it going on. But you ought to reach a place where your behavior is reverent. That, that's when you were young, the spandex days. Is it spandex? What, what is it now y'all wear? What is it? Is it spandex? Huh? Is that what it is? I, I don't know what the name of stuff. Leggings. Leggings. Look at your neighbor and say, take the leggings off. Tell your neighbor. Take them off, reverend. You, 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 you get a level of maturity, you get seasoned, and you recognize that you don't want anybody to be attracted to you on the basis of your shape. When you get reverent, you want somebody to be attracted to your inner beauty and not your external beauty. You want somebody to love you, not for what you look like, but for who you are. Excuse me for a second. And so, and so Paul says that the older women uh, must be reverent in behavior. And I, I want to tell young folk, you got to be pushing towards, you got to be aiming toward uh, being able to have experience under your belt so when you get older, you don't have to look back on your life with regrets with what you've done and who you were with and, and what you did. You want to be able to look back and say, I have spent my life well. A godly woman has reverent behavior. Hold up, he doesn't stop there. But oh, ooh, look at here, he says right here in verse 3, not slanderers. I want to know, do you have righteous conversations? Ask your neighbor, do you have righteous conversations? Y'all not asking them right. Ask them, do they have righteous? Let me, let me define. I, I think it's interesting that out of all of the things that Paul could talk about, one of the things he talks about in teaching Titus to minister to women, he speaks about this thing of slandering. It has to deal with what comes out of your mouth. The word slander means to accuse, to speak evil, 
to be malicious, to give false reports, to engage in ungodly conversations. And y'all might as well be honest and confess, I should have got a few more amens than that on that point, because probably many of you sitting in this room today, this is a pastoral statement I'm about to make. This is a pastoral statement I'm about to make. This is a pastoral statement that I am about to make. <laughs> Many of you have conversations on the phone in which your girlfriend, your sister girlfriend, talking about people, finding fault in everybody. Some of y'all going to go home and talk about the sermon that I preached today, and it's, and it's not going to be positive. Amen. Paul says that you got to teach these women, and you got to look for a righteous woman that, who have righteous conversations. Is God, did you not know that God is on the conversation with you? Righteous conversations, not slandering, not speaking evil, not finding fault, not rip, repeating false accusations, talking about stuff that you don't know just based on what somebody told you. Don't you know that by the time you got the, the message and somebody told you it had been embellished and fixed up and this added to it and here you are spreading it along. Go on and preach, Pastor. You spreading along just like it's truth. You need to get off the phone. Get off the phone. <laughs> Paul says, a righteous woman is not a slanderer. Oh, he didn't stop there. Oh, look at the next one. Not given to much wine. Now, I thought long and hard because I know this service has a problem with this section of scripture right here. <laughs> Look to your left and right. Anybody looking straight ahead? That's who I'm talking to right there. I, I inevitably get questions from people all the time. Matter of fact, uh, we, we have a um, minister's class. We treat minister's class one and, and we train people about ministry and we have a section in the class that deals with um, the qualifications of a minister and and one of the qualifications it says is not given to much wine okay and inevitably somebody in the minister's class wants to know when is too much much <laughs> Yeah, we just had that class just a couple weeks ago, and there was much discussion about how much is too much. And, and I thought I ought to spend just a few moments talking about this with this wine gluttonous service. And I thought I should talk about it because um, ultimately people will find uh, an excuse to justify drinking. Now, let's be clear, y'all. The wine that they drunk in that day is not the liquor that you drink today. Look straight ahead, nobody know I'm talking about you. As a matter of fact, I believe um, um, this particular um, statement goes beyond just wine drinking. Let me just add this to this real quick and then I gotta I gotta roll on I don't have time to hang here as much as because I feel something right here I feel like I need to hang here for a few moments um, when you take the whole context of what God says about wine and drinking in context the scripture is clear that the Bible talks about the fact that you can get tricked and deceived you can get in bondage to uh, uh, drinking certain things and the attitude of God is revealed throughout the whole Bible that anybody who dabbles in it is not wise. Look at your neighbor and say, you are an unwise joker. Yes, you is. I feel, I feel kickback. I feel tension in the room. I feel, I can tell when y'all with me because when y'all with me, y'all be saying amen. Y'all be dropping money up here on the, up the thing. Y'all be standing, waving at me, but ain't nobody, I don't see no money up here. here today. I, nobody's standing, waving their hands. Nobody's encouraging me on. There's tension in the room, and when I feel tension, I don't back off. I preach the harder against it. I come the firmer against it. 
the Bible says it's unwise. But I believe this passage is beyond just wine drinking. That's why I want to ask you the third question. And here's what I really want to talk about with women is do you have ridiculous habits? Because you can have habits that are beyond just liquor drinking. You know what I discovered? That people who have a, a drinking problem don't realize they have a drinking problem. And some people define and being an alcoholic as though you have to every, every day get drunk. No, no, you don't have to get drunk every day. Amen. You don't, you don't even have to get drunk every weekend. Amen. It's just that you have no self-control over your self and whenever your flesh craves, you, you accommodate your flesh. But I'm calling for women to be holy women, righteous women, godly women, and don't even mess with it. Look at your neighbor and say, that goes for you too, bro. Go ahead, tell them that's you too. It goes both ways. And not just drinking, but any kind of habit that you might have that is not pleasing to God. I believe this, this section of scripture goes beyond a wine. I believe he's talking about habits. Uh, any kind of habit that you can have, anything that's detrimental to your walk with God, anything that's de metro, de uh, uh, problematic, <laughs> that is a problem or detrimental to your development in Christ. Everybody needs to take an examination of their own life and ask yourself what happens, what things are a regular part of my life that keeps me from becoming everything that Christ has called me to become. Can I get an amen right there from anybody? I want to find out, do you have ridiculous, and matter of fact, why do I call it a ridiculous habit? Because all my other points were R, start with R, reverend behavior, righteous conversation, and I couldn't find any other word with R that would fit, so I chose the word ridiculous, and I call it ridiculous because if you're doing something that's crazy, if you're doing something that's not positive, if you're doing something that is hurting you, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Give me the, let me give you the fourth and final point. It says in verse 3 that a godly woman is a teacher of good things. And I want to ask the question, are you revealing what's right to others? Are you revealing? If you're a godly person, you, would, you want to help show other people what's the right way. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul says that the older woman should be, in verse 4, admonishing the younger women. Now, now, hear me clearly. Here's what's missing in our culture. We've lost godly women that are willing to pour their lives into younger women. You know, when, when I grew up in this church, I grew up in the First Baptist Church in Glen Arden, and the mothers of the church, the mothers of the church, took the young women underneath their wings and loved on them. See, see the difference today and what was back then, if a, if, a, if a young woman came in church and she wasn't living quite right, the older women would develop a relationship with these younger women and put their arms around them and love them and coach them, but that's not what goes on today. In today's culture, when a young sister is not right, the older women will ridicule them and talk about them and, and, and be critical of them. They don't develop a relationship with them. They don't pour into them. They don't show them how much they love and concerned about them. We have, unfortunately, a culture where they'll talk about them. And the problem is, the reason they talk, a lot of these older women talk about the younger women and how they dress, and they are this and they're that. And they're only mad because they ain't like that no more. They want to be. But they've, they've lost days long gone past. <laughs> when ultimately what the older women should be doing is taking them under their wings and pouring into them. That's why I'm grateful that at this church right here, the First Baptist Church of Glenard, we got ministries designed for women to pour into other women. Yeah. That's what we're about. We got... 
We got discipleship groups, and we got brothers, sisters in discipleship, and Queen Esther, and we got all of these uh, 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 discipleship programs where we develop relationship. If you haven't been in one of these programs, you need to get in one of these. It's life changing. It's it's it conforms your life. It helps you. We've got we've got programs where sisters embrace them and teach them. Now you might not want to wear that anymore. You might not want to have those kinds of conversations. You might, you might. Matter of fact, here's what they teach. Here's what he said. Teach them that they, number one, they are, they are verse four, that they, they, that they admonish the younger women, number one, to love their husbands. Y'all see that right there? Love him. Love. Love him. Love. Love. Love him. Amen. Thank you, McLean. I got an amen right there. Praise him. Amen. I thought all the brothers would be clapping and saying, preach on, pastor. Amen. You see, what overcomes whatever issues in a life is, is, is a woman's love has the capacity to take her jacked up husband and help turn his life around. Speak, speak well of him and set a dog in him and telling all your girlfriends what he ain't and he ain't this and you don't like that. He was good enough for you to marry him. He was good enough for you to say yes. And, and matter of fact, he was so fine when you married him, but now he's all jacked up. The only thing that's changed, he was okay before he got married and now he ain't so good after he got married. The only thing that's changed is he got married to you. Come on, brothers, help me out here. Don't leave me hanging out here by myself. Love him. We know he ain't bringing the bacon home. We know he ain't doing all the stuff he's supposed to do. We know he don't spend time with you. We know he's a mismanager. We know he can't see the answer to the question because he don't even know that there's a question on the table to be answered. We know all of that. But until he gets to where God wants him to be, the call of God is for you to love the hell out of him. I was just looking, just checking, thought that perhaps something might show up by somebody. McLean, McLean. I got to hurry up. I act like I got all day to love their children. Teach them to love their children. I'm so amazed at the number of people who are not caring for their kids. The children that are growing up today are the product of not being loved and parented. I cannot get my head around these women who killed their children. I can't get my head around it. It causes my heart to bleed and it makes me give God praise that I had a mother who loved me, who cared for me. Teach them to love their children. Teach them, he says in verse five, look at this string of things in verse five, to be discreet. Somebody says discreet. That means to have your passions under control. Be, have some control. That's what discreet means. Uh, so, so teach them to be, to be discreet. Chaste. Somebody say chaste. chaste. That means pure behavior. Teach them to be homemakers. Somebody say homemakers. Here it is. It's all right here in the text. I'm just walking down through the scripture. Teach them that they have a priority to make their homes. You know what I discovered? I discovered about a woman that she is a multiplier. Whatever you give her, she's going to give it back to you, press down, shaking the other run and over. If you give her a house, she'll give you a home. If you give her groceries, she'll give you a dinner. Come on, a meal. If you give her a seed, she'll give you a generation of a family on. She's a multiplier. Somebody say, she's a multiplier. Be makers at home. Homemakers. Make your home that the word of God may not be blasphemed. I'm sorry I ran out of time. I'm rushing through this, but y'all get the thing. Uh, 
Oh, let's see, there was one other point. I, I, I passed over obedience to their own husbands. Y'all thought I was going to miss that, didn't y'all? <laughs> He came all the way back from the back right there. <laughs> all right. Do I need to say anything more about this point? <laughs> the worst thing a woman can do is go home, a wife, and tell her husband. This is what Pastor Jenkins said. <laughs> now he come to church, he got an attitude with me. I ain't never even met the man. Because you listening to me more than you listening to him. I ain't your husband. Stop calling my name. Don't call my name. My name ain't never saved nobody. My name can't get you a cup of coffee in the store. But there is a name. <laughs> that is above every name. And at that name, every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. At that name. And I recognize, I done gone through this list, and some of y'all are guilty as charged. You don't measure up to the standards of a godly woman, but I got great news for you. You know what's great? Is whether you measure up to being a godly woman or not, he loves you. Oh, how he loves you and me. Regardless of our mess-ups and our failures and our wrong and our sin and our habits he loved us enough to die on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven and we could have a relationship with him he loves you Jesus died on the cross because he loves you just you know what the scripture says while we were yet sinners while we were in the middle of our sin he died for us I don't know about you but I want to give God praise for dying for us Hallelujah. Somebody needs to give him their life today. Somebody needs the forgiveness of sins today. Jesus died on the cross, was buried, rose again, and by him doing that, your sins can be washed away. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He loved you enough to die for you. And it is at this point of our service that we make an opportunity for you to come and get it right with him. If you're not saved, you need forgiveness of your sins. You don't know the Lord Jesus. This would be the great time to come. Maybe you've examined your life. You know, you know what you say, I'm not a righteous person. I'm not a godly person. Male or female, God can make your life right. He can turn you around. He can, he can change your heart. This would be a great time to come and say yes to him. Unsaved would be a great time right now. Backslidden, maybe you started with God, but you've drifted away. This is a, day, this is a good day to get restored in your fellowship with God. Or maybe you're number three, you're not sure of your eternal destiny. We can help you get absolutely assurance right here today or maybe you're already saved and you need a church this here is a good church tell your neighbor real quick this here is a good church now do me a favor go ahead and talk to the person next to you find out are you do they fall in any one of these categories just ask them are you saved are you if you were to die today ask them if you were to die today would you do you know that you would go to heaven go ahead ask them ask them wait for their answer wait for their answer are you sure if not let's get it right with God right now come on say I'll walk down there with you you don't have to walk down here by yourself I know some people are afraid come on let's get it right with God right now